What's up? So I apologize in advance if there's some background noise or whatever. Apparently today's deep clean over all the whole building. Whatever. But I'm going to go over daily coding problem. Number four, which I believe is rated as hard, supposedly. Given an array of integers, find the first mis missing positive integer in linear time and constant space. In other words, find the lowest positive integer that does not exist in the array. The array can contain duplicates and negative numbers as well. For example, the input 3, 4, negative 1, 1 should give 2. The input 1, 2, 0 should give 3. You can modify the input array in place. So, a pretty simple I think, you know, maybe the solution is considered more involved, but the uh, the problem seems fairly straightforward that, you know, obviously if you were to put this array in order here, we'd have a, of the valid numbers, it says, uh, give an array of integers, the first missing positive number, so that would be one through, positive one through infinity, through positive infinity, potentially, and, uh, that's it, just the first missing one. So right here, if we put the one first, we can see that out of these numbers, uh, there is no two out of the four elements in the array. And then down here, we can see that uh, zero wouldn't count. That's not a positive number, just like negative one, of course, is a positive number. Um, and then, so the first missing number would be three. And if it's a, you know, considering that we can't really ask questions because this is a daily, uh, daily coding problem, so we just have to go with the information here and the best assumptions that we can we can make off of that. So this uh, you can modify the input array in place is key. I think that's kind of given when you consider constant time, or excuse me, linear time and constant space. Constant space, if you have any sort of like uh, data structure there, you're not going to be able to create an entirely new like data structure other than you know just a handful of like temporary variables or something like individual variables of course those are fine because those are constant you could use you could create a fixed length array that doesn't vary based on input size that would be considered constant space if that if no matter what input you give it you always even if it's a huge array um technically that would not violate that principle. But the thing is, is that if you do a huge array, is that array going to be big enough? Like, why are you using a huge array, right? Is that going to always be big enough? It might be big enough for most of the example cases we might think of off the top of our head. But, you know, with some extremely large scaled input, you know, just unbelievably large input, that uh, eventually that would probably hit some barrier and then it even if we used a huge humongous array it might be way too big for uh, lots of small input so knocking that stuff out of the way so the big the deal here is is this what I've highlighted this is the big the two big constraints here and normally with a situation like this you're probably going to run into one constraint or the other but to have both of these at the same time linear time which means we the size of the input can only vary like linearly against or excuse me the complexity the worst case complexity can only vary linear up to worst case scenario linear so we can't have like o of n squared it can only be big o of n so that max and uh basically most all comparison sorts are going to be n log n. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's n log n complexity, right? So that's uh, that's best case. That's best worst case. So, and by best worst case, I mean there's like, there's big O, which is basically worst case scenario. Like given the most unordered worst input you can get, what's the longest this is going to take? with whatever algorithm right and then you have big omega which excuse me that's the uh the worst best case 
or we could just say best case to make it simple. So that's like, you know, um, say you're searching through a list for, like if we're going to search through this list for the number four, then wherever that four might be at in this array, or like I guess I should just say one for the worst case, we're going to have to go one, two, three. We're going to have to go through the whole length of the array, which is n, right, the input size, to find this one. So that would be O of n linear time, right? But if we were searching for the three, that would be like, as soon as we come in, that would just be, boom, we could kind of say like if we're, like if our algorithm's just supposed to get the first element of an array or of a list, even like a linked list that we have a reference to the head, then it's gonna be constant time because we just take that reference and go right to that very first value and bam, every time it's just gonna be that same step or three that are, you know, other than like slight <laughs> variances around the speed of light or something like that, if you want to think of it like that, it, it's going to be like as far as humanly perceivable, no matter how big of a list we give it that can fit within the computer's entire memory range and all that, it's just going to be, it's always going to go straight to that first element and we won't really notice the difference. So that would be constant. That would be O of, o of uh, one constant, big O of one constant, right? Well, if we're just going to search for the random number throughout here, like say there was like a five, we think somewhere in here, if that five was in the, the best case would be O, o of one, right? The constant, if the five was the first thing, and if the five was the last thing, or if the five wasn't in there and we just had to return like false or some other result to say that like five wasn't there, then that would be linear. So best case, O of one constant, worst case linear. Well, what we're going for here is worst case linear, of course, because if they don't say, then they're probably talking about big O, right? It's not big theta, it's not big omega, um, which sometimes people will loosely use those terms, like they'll say best average case or best best case, right? So big omega does describe the best, best case. Sometimes people will say big theta to describe the average case, but that's not necessarily true. Um, Big theta would be like, that's the theta symbol that looks like the O with the little dash in the middle. And the omega, of course, looks like the horseshoe. Um, kind of like plays on, I think, like an O looking symbol, a roundish symbol. But anyway, the uh, I'm not good at math, so there's probably a whole mathematical history behind it and everything, but I don't know. That's I just use those mnemonics. But theta is more of a tight bound runtime. So theta would be if, the best case big O omega and the worst case big O are the same, then you could say big theta, <laughs> which means that just that's a way a very a more concise way of saying like the best and worst case are the same and here's what they are without describing them both. If they're a little bit different, then big theta can also describe those margins. So big theta is just basically a way to say to describe um, the best and worst case at the same exact time. And if they're the same, then you just say that one concise uh, case with the, the, the type bound. So like, if no matter what, if say you have a linked list and you want to count the amount of items in it, that's going to be a, uh, a big theta linear, a big theta n. So it because it would no matter what if it counts those if it doesn't have a count stored somewhere then it's going to have to go through and count each and every one of them best case or worst case it's going to be the same but anyway that's just a little little quick two pennies on that whole thing um, but yeah so if we start looking into digging into like what we need to do here what the possibilities are so it's like obviously we're probably going to have to sort this that I think is the very most instinctual thing to do is put this in a sorted order and then count up from the bottom and see like just start counting one two three four five and then as soon as it's like hey five's missing or something you know then go okay that's the number that's missing and return it to put it really simply well the problem is is that we can't do that in linear time like and constant space we could do it in equal or less than linear time if we uh, use other, you know, variable data structures that would vary based on the size of the input. But that's the tricky thing is to be able to do 
to have one, have your cake and eat it too with this whole thing right there. But it is possible. I started to think it wasn't for a minute, but I thought, you know what, this, this seems like it should be possible. I even went on the internet and researched what other, a lot of other people's answers and stuff because I was just taking so long to try and wrap my head around it and look into the possible search algorithms and whatnot. And a lot of the people who were doing it, I would say most of the examples were wrong. The people were either not completely testing all cases, you know, at least the cases I'm aware of, of different various things of like, they were leaving out potential for, you know, all negative numbers or things like that. Or else they actually were creating variable data structures that violated the constant space constraint. So anyway, what we can do is we can go through this list and we can put everything in order that is a valid number. So if it's above zero and below the length of the array, so because you know if we had a hundred in this list, then we know that one if all if all we had was one hundred four times in this list, then we know the lowest positive integer missing from this list is one, right? So it doesn't matter. And that number's way beyond like even if we had one, two, three, four, and then we know the next one five is the one that we need, um 100 would still be irrelevant then, right? So we only really need the numbers that, that if we put them in their proper index, a one-based index. So one would go here in the first one, two would go in the second, three in the third, and four in the fourth. But, it, you know, underlying, they're still, the computer still thinks of it as zero, one, two, three in most languages, right? So we need to, we're going to have to do a little bit of like, add a one to it just to kind of offset it or subtract a one. I mean, you know, that type of a thing. Basically add a one to the value if we're looking at it to compare it or subtract a one when we go to put a value in its place and just kind of offset that to give us at the high level, at the surface level, to give us that one based indexing and uh, deal with the zero based indexing under the hood. If that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, just watch it and you'll see how that plays out. So if we do that and we put all these numbers in the correct space, we'll have one here. We'll, we'll go through it actually, I should say at first. We'll go through and we'll look at the first number for each number in the list and we'll say, hey, this is a three. It's in the first spot. It's supposed to be a one, right? So that's not right. That's, you know, that is a valid number, but it obviously goes somewhere else. So then we'll go, hey, what's in the third one? One, remember one based, one, two, three. There's a negative one there. Okay, negative, before we even worry about what negative one is necessarily, as long as it's not three, as long as threes, since there can be multiple threes, right? So we only want to move three into its place one time for various reasons. For one, it'd be like a little wasted swap operation if we kept copying it over itself. And for two, um, you can end up in like an endless loop if you do that very easily, so. There's lots of reasons it just keeps it way simpler. Just You just look in there, you peek in there. Hey, am I already stored there? Is my proper value already stored there? No. Okay, we'll go ahead and move the three here. And right as before we do that, we'll save the number one out to a little temporary variable, which is okay. We're allowed to create a small handful of variables or big ones, right? But we're allowed to create a fixed number of variables, so we can do that. We'll create a, one little fixed temp variable. Slide the three over there take that negative one out of that temp variable and put it there. Just effectively swap those two values, right? And then, so that one will be bad. That will be a negative one in the positive one place, but that's okay. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna say, hey, moving on with life, leave that bad number there and go to the next one, four. Four is valid, it's within the range and positive and all that good stuff. So we're gonna spit it in the fourth spot over here and then we're gonna take this one and put it in that spot. And before we move, we're gonna look at that number that we just swapped in and we're gonna say, hey, is that a valid number two? Or, you know, a valid, any valid number, not two specifically. And uh, then it's, it's gonna say, yeah, you know, that's, that's within range and it's a positive number. Okay, well, let's put it in its spot. So we'll put it here in the one spot and that negative one that will effectively be there will come over to this spot. And we'll look at that negative one, take a glance at it, and we're like, oh, yep, there's that bad number again. So we're not going to stress on it. We're just going to move on. 
then we'll go here to the third spot, which we of course move that three at the very beginning here, right? And we'll look at it and we'll go, okay, we're in the third spot. Is this the number three? Yeah, it is. Okay, don't worry, that's cool, move on. Then we'll go here, fourth spot, is that a four? Yeah, cool, right on. So move on, right? And then once we move on, we'll realize, hey, we're at the end of our list, so go to the whole next little block of processing. Now we need to start back over and we just need to count up through the list one time, one last time. And this time when we count, we're gonna check. All we're gonna do is val verify everything that we just did. So that first one will be that positive one in the first spot. That's cool, one and one. Then we get here in the second spot. Two and two, nope. In the second spot is gonna be that negative one. So bam, we stop, we say, hey, we got a bad number. The bad number on the second pass is effectively serving all the bad numbers are effectively serving as placeholders for the missing good numbers, right? That should, if that was just a positive one through four list, or if it's one through 10 positive or one through N, whatever it happens to be positive numbers, when, as soon as you get to that first one, that shows you, hey, that number was missing. And of course we could go on and test for other numbers if we really wanted to, but that's all we need to do to successfully complete this. So we get there and we just say, hey, we're in the second position and we got a bad number. So we return the position number, which gives us a two as a result. And the same thing here, we come in, check it. First one, is that a one in the first place? Yeah. Is that a two in the second place? Yeah. So is that a three in the third place? No. Okay, well, keep going. Oh, we're at the end of the list. Start over, count through one last time. And then we check them all. Is one in the first place? Yeah. Is two in the second place? Yeah. Three in the third place? No. Okay, we'll return that place we were at where there's supposed to be a number that's valid. It was three. So that basically explains the a simplistic version, which covers most of the conditions that we need to check for. And we just got to convert that to some code and we should be ready to rock. And of course, we need to remember linear time, constant space, which that should do because we're using the data's the data within the structure in place, we're modifying itself, and linear time, even though it may seem like, well, we run through the list twice, isn't that worse than linear time? And it's not, because in the O of N, um, or excuse me, well, yeah, in O of N, but in big O, it's the big order. It's the largest factor, right? And no constants. So if we go through that list exactly twice every time, then two times n would be like, you know, before we simplify, so to speak, it would be big O, two of n, or two times n, excuse me. And that two is a constant factor, right? That two is always going to be there regardless of that input size. So it doesn't matter. So we get rid of it and we're left with big O of n. So that's allowed. You could even have um, 100 n, big O of 100 n, right? and that would still be allowed of course you that might be a signal that hey maybe this might not be the most efficient thing but it's only going to grow linearly so if you take like a smaller medium sized input and you're okay with the amount of time versus the input then even if you give it a large input you might be all right with the amount of time it's not going to be like you know you you run into things like uh factorial and factorial and stuff like that where you know, with just literally just a few times, like uh, you just basically double an input a few times in size. And next thing you know, you're just waiting forever, <laughs> like scientifically forever for the process to complete. So that's the kind of thing you're trying to avoid is like, oh, I tested this out on a little five number list and it was fine, you know, and now I'm giving it 50,000 numbers and it's never completing even in a year's time or something. So. Of course, that's the extreme we're trying to avoid here. So what we'll do first is an iterative solution and we'll create a function called first missing. And we're gonna pass it some numbers. And I'll just hit pass. That's just kind of like a little placeholder like curly braces, empty curly braces in Python for now to come down here and we'll pit, give it some test fodder. We'll assert, apologize for that background noise again. Um, come over here, where is it? 
I'll just copy this to make sure we get it all right. Back over here, paste it in. So if we call first missing right here, and we pass it these numbers, should give us this too. All right, and then if we give it a cert, first missing here. Those numbers, of course it will give us a three if everything's working properly. All right. So those are basically just like in place unit tests of after it, you know, it will call our function, it will pass us this, and it will make sure that it returns this. And if it does, it won't say anything. And if it doesn't, it will complain very loudly. So we can test run that right now. We can see right here, assertion error. That first call, first missing, right there, did not compare to two. So if we just copy that and paste it, then we can run it and you know maybe it would print more more details like it would at least give us the return value and if it was three or something we could do something like that but we don't have anything there yet so we know what the problem is so what we're going to do is we're going to come into our function and we're going to say for each number for i in the range of the length of numbers and Range of length of numbers is a little bit of a code smell in Python. <clears throat> Excuse me, you should be using like probably enumerate in most situations. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just use this because it's easier for, I think for people who are not Python programmers to understand. So it's just saying, you know, get the length of numbers, right? When we read it, we read length and then this little bracket of and then numbers and then the range of the length of numbers. So that range is going to give us zero through, you know, in this case there's four, so we'll give us zero up to, but not including four, which will give us four indexes, zero, one, two, three, right? Okay, and then so for each one of those, we're going to, uh, we basically want to do a conditional to make sure that that number is within our range. So we could do an if, but what we're going to do is a while loop because we know we're going to keep looping, or at least I know we're going to, right? That's the idea, is that um, after we swap that one here, then we'll, or excuse me, the negative one here, then we'll move on to the four, and the four will swap with the one, and then before it moves to the next one, you know, on that for each loop is what has it moving to each next one, it's going to loop again over itself and check if that one could be moved and of course it can and it will move that. So that's why we have this nested while loop. So just remember that the for each is the one that actually moves the position and the while is the one that continually loops over that position. Now you might be wondering, hey, this is a nested loop. Isn't that n times n? And it potentially could be, and it would be in a lot of cases, but in this one, it's not. And that is because if you think the worst case input here, I'll just pretty much worst case input is going to be something like this. Um, if we do the first one 10 and then go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine like that, and then this will be 11. So if we picture right here, what's going on is, we'll come in here on the for each loop, and then we'll check it with this while stuff that I'm gonna put right here that says while um, the value of numbers i, which will give us this first one, this first one time through will be zero, this is at the zero index. Well, numbers i is greater than zero, and which 10 is and numbers i is less than or equal to the length of numbers so the length here there are 10 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 values right 
because we're going off that one based index that's why we have to have like on a lot of times we just do that right if we're zero based because we know ah, we actually want one less than the length but this time we are going for one through the length so that's why we have that equals there and we can see that it does fit within that bounds so then we'll go ahead and add one two three four one two three four how I like to indent that. And we need to also check that numbers i is not equal to numbers i, oops, numbers, numbers, uh, minus one. And then go ahead and do all this stuff. Okay, so what this is saying is also the third check. This first one right here, just remember that's just checking if it's within our valid range of positive numbers. So it's one or higher and less than or equal to the length of numbers here. Otherwise, it's just an invalid number, right? And so then if we have a valid number, we need to make sure that that valid number isn't already in its place. So like right here, one's that first one is already in its place. So that we can just, this will bypass the while loop and we can go back to that for loop which is effectively going to move our position over one right and what's going on here it's kind of like a little bit confusing to the uninitiated maybe what we're doing is we're going into numbers i and grabbing that value so the first time through that will be zero so we're grabbing this value right here and then we're subtracting one from it and so that will turn this one into a zero because it's actually at the index if it's in the proper spot it's at the index that's one lower than itself right so that's what that minus one's all about and the reason we don't do minus one like that or or any other ways is because this is going to get numbers at i minus one so if we're already at zero and we try and do that we'll try and get negative one which in some languages will give you an error and say you can't reference an array with a negative number and in Python it will actually give you the last um, the last value over there so that's why we need to keep that in a bracket like that so that we're actually pulling that number out we're pulling out the one and this that one is replacing that like that when we pull it out and then one minus one will replace all that with zero so it's saying if numbers i, number zero, is not equal to number zero, so it is, it is equal to, it's equal to that, so it will bypass whatever we're gonna give it for the while loop and come right back up here to the four, and we'll get the next one for i and range length of numbers, which will be one and move right there. So that should make sense. Oops. Okay, and so, all that said and done then what we need to do is if we're working with a valid number that hasn't been swapped into its place or wasn't just in its place to begin with so we need to go ahead and swap that and in order to do that of course we need a temporary variable so we'll call that remembered remembered that will be our remembered number and we're going to remember what's in numbers this whole thing right here we'll just copy it We're going to remember what's in there so like on this first one it's going to remember this three and then while we're remembering that three we're going to move into our current location numbers i is just basically the value at our current location we're going to move into that one numbers dot numbers dot numbers this thing uh it doesn't deal with that in very good okay so we remember that number and then we move that number in, oh wait, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this a little bit wrong here. Should do it this way. There we go. Easy to get confused, of course. So we're remembering that number, we're storing that number into remembered, and then we're storing our current number into its proper location. And then we're gonna go ahead and bring remembered back out that remembered number you could call it temp or holding or whatever you want to oops I don't know why I'm backwards numbers 
i equals gets remembered gets the value and remembered so i probably just overcomplicated explain that but yeah the value the index the, you know the three is going to go to remembered then the one i'm sorry that's not the right way it's going to go okay negative one the first time the iteration through negative one is going to get remembered then three which is at this spot that's three in there right that's going to go into the proper spot which will be zero one two three minus one which will put it in this third spot and then we're going to grab that negative one that's out here being remembered and we're going to paste it in that current location which will be the first one okay that is definitely what's should be going on there okay then if we then we'll come through the loop again and it will test on that negative one and it will say if that number is greater than zero and it's not there will be a negative one right here and it will be just looping over itself in that spot and it's going to say hey that that number is not cool so um for one thing i have this indention wrong python of course is indention sensitive okay so it's not so it's going to skip past all of that and when it skips past all that we'll end up back up here which will increment its position to four it will come in here yeah it's within range no there's no four over here yet so go ahead and do that whole remembering thing of pull the one out slide the four over and drop the one back down there and then it will look at the come back through and it will say hey is that one in the you know range yes is it uh, already in its correct spot? Is there already a one in its correct spot? No, there's not. Okay, go ahead and pull the uh, negative one that will be there out, slide the positive one over, and drop the negative one in right there. And now we're basically, then we'll come right here. I'll just go ahead and finish it out since we're already this far. So we'll come right here and this that three will already be here. It will have come back out to here, incremented to get there. And then it will test is that within range yes is it is there already a three in its correct spot yeah because its correct spot is it just happens to be exactly where it's already at because this will evaluate to that value three and this which will this will give us the three and this will take one off of that three which will be zero one two and that will equal the three that we are currently at and checked against the adjusted for zero and one based indexing value which is of course all the same so then it will skip past all this and it will come back out here and slide itself over to that final position and it will say which should be the four and it will say is it within range yes is that number uh not a, you know are these is that number the same as the number that belongs there yes it is okay so we can skip all this stuff again and now we come back out here the for loop and it's like hey guess what we're done running through the the valid range here so now the for loop will complete and we'll be down here outside of the for loop so in this case now we need to start back over through the list like we said and go through each value and say for i in range of the length of numbers one last time and as far as like the duplication of this right here like length of numbers yeah that is a calculation and I don't want to duplicate myself too many times if I do that I should probably just evaluate the length of numbers one time since it's not changing and then just use that length right like up here but I just want to let you know the way that I approach dry is I'll let myself get away with it two or three times with something minor like that and then on that that fourth time or whatever I'll say that's it I'll go up and I'll create you know all right length you know sorry I shouldn't do it so sloppy I'll, I create a length equals length of numbers and then I go through and replace all these with just the word length but I'm not going to do that just yet because that is a little bit of complexity on its own right and I mean whatever so there's a little trade-out going there there's always a trade-off so if it happens one more time if I have to do that length one more time I will go through and do that but just my reasoning behind why I haven't yet 
Okay, so for each number, starting at the first number, if numbers i is uh, not equal to i plus 1, then we're going to return i plus 1. So what's going on there is on that list, you know, once we have the right order there, it's going to be something like 1, 2, or excuse me, 1, negative 1, 3, 4, right? That's what this will look like when it's semi-sorted or however you want to think of it as. And uh, so we'll go through that first one. Numbers I will be 0, and it will say is 1 equal to 0 plus 1. And yeah, that's true. So it will just skip this little return thing and come back up here, and it will move the index over effectively, and it will say is negative 1 not equal to uh, 1 plus 1, which should be a 2, right? So it's like, yeah, negative 1 is not equal to 2. So since that condition would be true, it will come in here and it will return 2 because we're at index 1 plus 1, you know, to offset for that 0 base. And that's how that works right there. But what if we go all the way through that list and the the number's not in there, you know? So what if it's 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, after this is ordered, say this was a 2 in here, and so it'd end up ordering 1, 2, 3, 4, and we go through that list, well, nothing's going to not equal. Everything is going to equal its thing, so it's always going to skip this and move up, and then pretty soon we're going to drop out of the, the for loop, right? Well, in that case, if we drop out of that for loop, then what we want to do is just return... Um, the length, oh, there it is, the length of numbers plus one, right? Because that, uh, the length of numbers would be like one, two, three, four, but we need that five that would be there. So that's what we do. And now since I have done this too many times, I'll go ahead and replace that with length and come up here before I forget and do just like what I was saying, length equals length of numbers. And then I can just copy this and just replace that like that. And it's easy to see in here because it's has that nice bright keyword. Okay, so that should all be effectively the same thing except that fixed length is just calculated once at the beginning of the function, so. All right, so that's all that. Now the we run into a situation where I've already taken a long time explaining it, so I'm not going to just like run into the errors. I'll just put it out there. It, what if we have an empty list? If we send an empty list, what do we expect back? Well, we don't have an interviewer or client or anything to ask, so we'll just say, well, uh, an empty list, I would think it should have one in it, right? Or you could make some other arbitrary value to return if you'd rather do that but just the fact of dealing with the empty list might be a good next next step to take um so we want to return a one so up here in python if we were to actually go in and try and get a range and everything we'd run into trouble because um at first it would give us a range it would say that range is zero right but then when we went in and we tried to index with zero then it would say hey there's not there's not a zeroth element you know, because if there was like one would be the zeroth element or nine, if I did it like that, there's not even a zeroth element. So that's a special case. So we need to come up here and say, or I guess calculate the length first, and then say if length is, uh, we could say less than one, or just say length compares to zero, then return one. Okay, so that should deal with that case. And let's just see if it works. Remember it, not defined on line 12. Remembered. All right, it didn't complain, so that means that all of our assertions should pass. So if I were to change this first one to one or something, that's not gonna be true, so we'll complain, hey, assertion error, that one's not equal to one, right? Just like in the beginning. But that's how, and that's how quick it ran too. So we'd want to do other cases as well, like, um, 
copy this one down and say, you know, let's go in here. One thing I like to do sometimes is just flip the numbers, like one, three, two, five, four. I've caught errors doing stuff like that before. And then if we pit in like some negative numbers in here, say like that, negative six, maybe some duplicate numbers too, like a one, three, three. You know, try different stuff. And uh, what's that one going to equal? One, two, three, four, five. Looks like there's no positive six in there. So we'll run that. And that one's good. So you want to do that. Anything you can think of, like, hey, I wonder what it would do if uh, if there was just one negative number in there. Like one negative nine. What would happen then? Anything that you're tempted to test, just make an assertion, and then you never have to type in that test again. That assertion will just always run it for you. That's the beauty of unit testing. What if we have a list that's multiple just negative numbers? That. Right, it seems to be working. And of course, if you want to see it, you can just copy out the uh, function without the comparison or the assert keyword and paste it in there. And then you can see it in the REPL, and then it gives you back the one or whatever value. Cool. So it works. And just, you know, think of as many test cases as you can in there. Um, some good ones are, of course, like nothing, zero, should be one. Um, oh, forgot the assert keyword. And then a, a one and a two, like simple stuff like that. Assertion error on the one because the one is there, so that one would be a two. Okay. And then we can even do stuff like get a little bit crazy and say like put a big number in like 500 comma negative one comma this comma that comma that comma that comma negative three something like that and the first one that would be a one also cool and i'll leave it at that for the moment um so right there one more last time through this one this is the iterative solution we come in we hard code the length or uh, at least memorize you know set the length to a variable so we don't have to recompute that a zillion times and then we test that length if the special case that it's empty we'll just immediately return a one so that we don't end up with errors then we'll come down here and for that first position through the last one we'll go into that position and test that it meets our criteria and if it does we'll swap it with the number of where it belongs and then we will come back and check if that swap number meets our criteria and we'll continue going through that until the swap number doesn't meet our criteria then we'll come back out here and increment this to the next position then come in so on and so forth until we get through the entire list then we'll start over at the beginning of the list and count upwards through it and check that each value is in its correct place as soon as we find one that's not in its correct place we know that's the number we need to return if we get all the way through the list and they're all in the correct place that means we need to turn return the one right after that would come next so that's how all that works and i don't think I totally explained why this isn't super linear why it still fits within the linear range um, that's because like in this worst case scenario right here we end up with the 10 we'll go over here into the 10 spot and then it will get the 9 over here right and then that while loop will check this 9 and it will come over here swap it with the 8 the 8 with the 7 7 with the 6 6 with the 5 5 with the 4 four with the three, three with the two, two with the one, and the one's in its correct spot. So then it will go back out to that outer for loop again. And it's already ran 10 times, right? It's already ran the length of itself. But then it, every single one of these will already be in its correct spot now. So it will run through the list twice. In that situation, in like the worst case situation, this while loop will run entirely through the list and then this outer for loop will just walk the list and verify that this while loop correctly handled everything. Um, and then this will go one more time. 
So that ends up with about a 3n. And that 3n is just like the 2n where it's like, that's three, it's not n times n, it's 3n. So we drop that least significant constant factor thing and that three, and then we're just left with O of n still. So technically it's still linear. Um, and then of course, most of the time it's, it's probably gonna be some variation like with random inputs and stuff, it's probably gonna be some variation where it's like gonna cycle through this one or a few times and then come back up here and increment and then cycle through this one or a few times. But either way, it's always gonna add up. And the way we can verify that is we can come in here and create a counter variable and initialize it to zero and then come down into our special case and set that count equal to one because in that special case, it's gonna go through one time and realize it's wrong, right? And the reason we do that is because in here we're gonna we're gonna increment that counter, right? So if we would have set this to one to count for this special case, and we'd come in here and we'd already be at two in the first time through, so it's easier just to set this at zero with each time through the thing, and then just in that one special case, just return both hard coded special values, right? Or not necessarily hard coded, but kind of sorta. So anyway, when we come in here the first time through the for loop, we're gonna set this as this is our first time through this loop, right? But then we need to count for each time through this while loop. So we'll set a count plus equals on the while loop too. So we'll come in here, we're at one. Then we'll come in here, if the number's invalid, then it will just skip through and go to the second position, right? So this counter is effectively counting how many times it's going through the for loop. And this counter in here is effectively counting how many times it's going through this while loop. And then Right here, when we do that last walkthrough, we need to add to that count two plus count plus equals one. Okay, yeah, I, for a second I was thinking, wait a minute, is count still in scope? But it is, yeah. So count still in scope, then all we need to do is make sure right before we return a value, we'll print the, uh, we'll print the length and the count. Just like that. So if it finds the numbers missing, it will still give us the length of the count. And even if it goes past all that and never enters into this, if that condition never evaluates to true and it ends up dropping through out here, we'll still get the length of the count. Go ahead and hit F5 and prop, nope. Local variable counter reference before assignment. Where did I call it counter at? Right here. All right, Bloop. okay, that was slow. I think that's because I'm doing the video. Like, usually it prints out a lot quicker than that. But anyway, so we could see for length four, it ran nine count, length three, six, 10. This was probably that worst case one. So you can see it's almost, it's 2.9 times 10 is effectively what that is. Because if we say 29 divided by 10, 2.9, so it's not quite 3n, it's like a hair under 3n. Um, that third one right here, remember I said that's like pretty much the worst case? I probably shouldn't even say pretty much. I am I could be wrong, but I think that's the worst case. And that third one is what gave us that. And then you can see the one right after it, 11 times two will be 22, so that's just a little bit over two. You can, if you need to do the math on it, you can just do 24 divided by 11, 2.18. Um, right here, length one, it went through twice. One went through twice. I shouldn't even say it went through twice. It cycled twice, basically, because on this one, the, uh, the ones, it's gonna come up here and it's gonna do the, uh, the one count for this. And then when it comes down here, it's going to add one onto it for going through and uh, doing that whole thing and returning that, right? Oh, it should actually return one right away on there. So why is that count? Oh, that's for length zero. Okay, yeah, for one, if there's one item in there, it will still come through and uh, try and do this one time. And then it will figure out, oh, it's only one and one is in its place. So it will skip past this, and that's why this counter won't increment again to two. 
and then this one will increment one when it goes through to find, oh yeah, one is in its place and da 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 and return it. So it's a little bit extra work for one. So one optimization of a trade-off for more code and less cycles would be to, uh, you know, kind of like flatten the loop by one little iteration for that special case would be coming here and say, if length equals one, you know, and da da da, then you could test if that first one's, if length equals one and the value is one, then return two. That would be an option, or you know, if it's not one, then return one. And if it otherwise, say you could say if length equals one and the value at numbers i is not one, or the value at the zero index is not one, then return one. Otherwise, it is one, so return two. Okay, anyway, you probably get the gist. So now let's go ahead and do an iterative version of all that. And the iterative version is going to be pretty much the same. I'll just do it from scratch. So first missing, and it's going to take numbers, and it's also going to have a depth, which is going to default to zero. So uh, what's going on there is like this depth down here when you call it, it's kind of, it's basically the the recursive version of an index and you could call it index if you want i'm just going to call it depth because it's sort of a which one do you want to choose you know and physically it represents the depth so to speak so if you had another language where you can't define a default value for a missing variable you could just pass it as zero just like that and just make this like depth like that but since this is python and it's has that handy dandy feature we're going to go ahead and just pass it like that just to let you know what's going on so when we come in we just need to effectively accomplish the same thing but we're going to try and do it recursively so that will be instead of doing looping we're just going to call the function again okay so we'll come in and we'll test that if and this time it's an if instead of a while because the while is a loop right so we want the conditional but it's just a one-off conditional excuse me so if um, numbers depth which could be the word index or you could even call this you could call it index or you could just call it i if you want i'm calling it depth so same effective thing i'm just instead of i i'm saying depth in this one if depth is greater than zero and numbers depth is less than or equal to length length of numbers, same thing here on the duplication thing, length of numbers, what do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what was our last thing? Numbers depth is not equal to, see how it's virtually the same exact thing? Depth minus one, then, so we've got a valid number and it hasn't been moved to it. There's nothing, the correct value isn't in its correct spot. So we're gonna just do that same swap thing, remembered. Remembered gets the uh, number in the correct spot, numbers. Numbers, numbers, depth, minus one, and then, oh, I just need to copy this. Then that value is going to get numbers at I, or depth. And then what else do we got here? Then we need to copy into numbers depth. The remembered, remembered, just like that. So that just effectively swapped them, right? Don't think we need to go over that any more times. Okay, so then after that, we need to call ourselves again because we're going to want to loop, and that's how we get that effective loop, right? First missing, or you know what? Actually, this is going to be called swap numbers, and then first missing, we'll take down here. Sorry about that. 
this is going to be the initialization function or the master function, whatever you want to think of it as. And it's going to call, first it's going to swap all the numbers. And then it's going to return the retrieve. We're going to create a retrieve missing function as well. So it's going to have two recursive functions. Because what's going on is different enough to justify that, you know, rather than trying to pack them into one like universal function, just it's like, okay, it's justified to get out of there. So when it, it, this will call first missing, first missing will come in and call swap numbers, which will call itself as much as necessary. Then it will return. Then it will come down and call retrieve missing. Which will go through the whole numbers list. It will basically be like that second for loop that went through the one last time to retrieve everything. So that's what's going on there. Okay, so while we finish this one off real quick, we're going to do all that and then we're going to call ourselves swap numbers. And we got to pass it numbers again, right? We've got to pass that value all around. It's actually just a reference, um, especially in Python. That's that it automatically is changing numbers in place. It's not work. We're not passing a copy around. We're passing that reference ID of where numbers is at, where that list is at in memory. And then each one of these functions and passes through and all that is going and looking at that same instance. It's looking at this, like if you just think of this as burned into memory from right here on, you know what I mean? This will get some ID like one, two, or five, one, two, four, three, oh, two or something. And so you could just effectively replace this with memory location 5013402, memory location 5013402, memory location 5013. So that's what's going on there. Um, so we're going to call numbers and then we're going to pass it the depth, but we're not going to increment that depth because remember this is a replacing that while loop and the depth represents that index value that we're on. So while is going to stay at that same index value, but just loop over each new value that happens to pop in there based on what it's swapped out with, right? So we're going to do that, and then that effectively will return after that, you know, like after it's done, and it's like, okay, we call ourselves again, and we come in here, and then finally this will evaluate to like a false situation, which we need to take care of right out here. And in that case, we're going to say swap numbers pass it numbers like always and we will increment increment the depth this time so this is what's kind of going on i've kind of left off some words like the return statements there's no return there's like an implicit return statement either excuse me right there or you could think of one as being implicit right here in python so it's kind of like a void function since we don't really need to return a value yet. I am going to change that at the last minute to show you the more proper recursive way since you would probably be more in a functional paradigm and you're not supposed to be doing side effect functions like this. But in Python that naturally happens so I don't want to over confuse it right now. But we do need an explicit return right here because otherwise um, you know, it will keep calling itself until this isn't true anymore. And then once that isn't true, if that return wasn't there, it would just come down here and call itself one more time, right? But what we want it to do is we want to return and kind of unwind that stack and then come here eventually and do that, if that makes sense. Because of what if we'd gone through the whole list here? If we came in and called ourselves with debt plus one, we'd just really be doing that. So what we can do to make it like maybe just a little bit less confusing, I just wanted to illustrate that, but if we put the return right here, but I'm not actually passing, you know, we're not returning any real value. So that's why I put the return afterwards because that's the same thing effectively. It will evaluate this first. And after that returns, this will return any value that that might've returned, which is just gonna be none right now, kind of like a null, right? Okay, anyway, after, so all that's done and then it comes through, it increments, it will sit in place and run this. And then eventually that will be, this stuff will be no good over some number, maybe because it went through the whole list in its whole spot. So then it will return and unwind back out of there. And it, you know, it will return out of this one and that will effectively 
be right here on the one before and then it will return and that will effectively be right here on the one before if it had recursed a bunch of times and it will just keep on returning and then once it's returned to the very final one it will return and it will come back out here and uh, this will be false I'm, I'm confusing myself now so I'm sorry if I'm confusing you it's easy to chase your tail in recursion, right? So anyway, you get out of there for every call into here. Is that first one is going to... It's The only time it's going to return out of here is if it actually calls itself. I think this is right. Maybe I'm wrong here. Let's check it out. Oh, I need to fill this out real quick. Running out of brain power, as usual. Okay, so retrieve missing is going to start at the beginning of the loop, so it's going to need a depth too. And same thing as before, depth will start at zero, call it index, whatever you want, do all that. Um, and we'll say if numbers at the current depth or index is not equal to depth plus one, just like the I before, right? Then we want to return depth plus one. And if we go all the way through that list and all of them seem to be in their happy right order, then we just need to return, return depth plus, or length plus one. Length of numbers plus one. Because if it's 1 through 10, length 10, then we want to return an 11. So that's why that would be like that. Okay, what special cases do we need to look out for? For one, the, the termination on recursion here. Uh, if length of numbers is compares to 0, then we want to return 1 right and then if we come in here it's missing now that's going to go through numbers is zero we'll return that one that makes sense we come out here just to be explicit i'm going to go ahead and do this that seems way more clear and that way we can see for sure we're returning it does look like we return a value and we could put the return statement right under to signify that we're not returning a value which if we did want to use recursion which is kind of unpythonic unless you're dealing with trees then we should do that so anyway it's sort of a code smell to say like hey why are you even using recursion and you're not using not iterating over trees Okay, so we come in here and numbers depth. What if numbers, what if depth is zero? We will already have returned a one there. So if length of numbers compares to zero, then we want to return a one. Is there any more special cases? Seems like there should be one more in here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and run it and see what happens. I always spell remembered on 20 is not defined. Remember. Probably not the best name for a variable if it's that hard. Index out of range on 15. Okay, so I'm not testing for the if. Um, depth is greater than length of numbers and return so this return one's not that's what I think is missing from up here this return one's not really returning a one 
I mean, it's returning a one, but if you look down here, we're not doing anything with it. We're not assigning that to anything. So that's just going off into the void. It's just more of like a return none type of situation. So when here we need to, uh, we have that, we have that returning that in that special case and then depth return. If it's greater than the length of numbers. Let's try it out. List index out of range. Depth is, uh, where do we go here? List index out of range on there. Depth, 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 depth. I think. I don't know why. I just ran through this not too long ago, but I had some issues going on, like the outside noise to where I couldn't record right afterwards. So I'm kind of not as fresh up on it as I wanted to be. So if the, uh, if depth is greater than or equal to the length of its return, right? So if depth is 10 and we're on 10, let's see, assertion error. Okay, so now we can just do this to see. I'm kind of glad I'm running into some errors. I like to, I don't like a whole lot, but a few. So five, that's not right. I think the number's a zero if depth is that. If numbers is turn depth plus one, that. What's, so we have retrieved numbers. We're coming up here. Depth starts out at zero. If length of numbers is zero, turn one. If numbers depth is not equal to depth plus one, so numbers at zero, uh, turn depth plus one. Otherwise, return that. Hmm. If numbers depth is greater than zero and numbers depth is less than or equal to length of numbers, then go ahead and and numbers depth at number minus one. Remember the number at the second spot, at the other spot, and in that spot, put the number that we're currently on, and then put the remembered number in the spot we're currently on. And then return swap numbers and depth. So that will call itself again if it needs to. We'll come through and do that. And then it will return, 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 you know what? I don't think that's supposed to be there, is it? Wow, <laughs> I can't believe I'm spacing all this out now. So one trick if you do run into this problem is to just come in here and print what numbers are. or whatever value might be important to you. We'll print numbers, comma, depth, and then run it. And then we get a little bit of feedback here, and we can see we started out with three, four, and all that's looking good. Our depth is looking good. So we can see right here, we can just run right through it. Three over here in one, two, three gets swapped with the negative one, and then right here it's gonna check is negative one any good? No, so it moves up to that four, and it says, hey, is four and one need to get swapped? Yeah, so it switch, swaps four and one. Then it moves up one to this three, and it says, is three good? Yeah, so it moves up one to this four, and it says, hey, is four good? Yeah, so then it comes through, or then it counts it, and well, yeah, that's what it should be. Why is it still going from there, right? So then it should start over and count after that. I'm going to pause it and use the restroom and look at it for a few seconds and see if I can wrap my head around it and then I'll unpause it. I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm just going to try and run through it and see. Um, I think I need a return statement there. I don't think this one's so imperative. I could have just left it there. 
What was going on with that? Okay. So, right here we can see we have depth zero, and then we stay at depth zero because it moves that uh, three over, and then after it moves that three over and swaps it with the negative one, then we know, okay, that, that's that invalid number, so we need to move forward one, which that depth increases one, and then we say, so we're at this four, and we say, hey, what's in four? We need to swap with one, so it does that, and then, while it's still there, it says, hey, can this one go somewhere better? It says, yeah, so it stays at that depth, and it puts the one there, swaps it with the negative one, and it's like, oh, invalid number again, right? So it's going to increase the depth, and that will put us on this three. Three's valid, but it's already in its correct location, so it increases the depth. Goes to four. Four's valid, but already at the correct location, so it goes there. And so all that's right. So what appears to be missing, this all seems to be good. It's got to be something to do with this retrieve numbers function. So we come into retrieve numbers. Depth is zero. And we can do the same thing with this too. We can just get rid of that in there since we know that's looking good. And then come here and paste that right there and do an F5 on that and see you get a paint out. Okay, so there's what's going on there. It's going through itself once. Oh, <laughs> you probably noticed this way before I did. Um, we're just going through once and returning length. Of, I think I've done this before too. <laughs> I know I have. Like, where instead of I get into iterative mode and I think like, oh, this is like, you know, some iterative loop. And then if I make it through there, then I need to just go ahead and return that, right? Well, the situation is we don't want to return that. That would be a special case up here. That's why I was looking one shy to me because I sat in here and uh, hammered it out. I'm glad I ran into that problem just to show kind of how to diagnose it and stuff like that too. But uh, yeah, I sat down an hour or two before now and was like, okay, let me see if I can just knock this out off the top of my head, which I had already last night licked the problem and, you know, whatever, kind of like tried out different test cases and all that kind of stuff on it. And so without even re referencing that, I was able to sit down and just knock it out, you know? And then I thought, well, I just knocked it out an hour or two ago, so I should just be able to sit down and do it like right over again on, on the screencast. But apparently it's not the way I work. Um, so we want to return this only in the case for one, I'll have it call itself right now, retrieve. That's in the clipboard. I just copied it there. Missing with numbers and then depth plus one. So that's, of course, a big dumb moment for me. And then uh, we want to return that if we go, if we call this self and if, so that's our special case for if numbers equal zero, we'll deal with that one right out the gate. And then um, we'll check if, before we get here though, the depth might be invalid. So we'll check if, if uh, depth is greater than the length members, red lining at the, the don't repeat yourself dry principle right there, right? With length of numbers, but we're still within my, my limits. Okay, so now if depth is greater, so if we have three values and depth is at four, then we know we want to stop, right? So we'll go ahead and just return the length of numbers. Well, we could just return depth then because depth would be four. So return depth. Or you could do length of numbers plus one if you think that reads better. So this is slight. This is considered an optimization because it might be a little one less calculation, but doesn't quite read as good. So there's the trade-off. Technically, the first time through, you should do length of numbers plus one, but I'm doing sort of a in-place optimization there, so to speak. And I'm just going to shut up and run it now. Index out of range, line eight, line eight right here so if depth is greater than or equal to length of numbers then return depth plus one there now at least it's consistent with all that so because if depth is equal to the length 
then we know on a zero based index we're actually one past where we need to be and we're going to use that zero based index on the low end right here you know of course we're adjusting it with the plus one for the high end stuff but anyway that should fix that problem and no errors no assertion errors no uh, runtime errors so that means that all of those tests are passing on all of that code there so we can see here find missing comes in calls swap numbers swap numbers comes down test for zero special case test you know you need that besides the special case we also need the uh, terminating case which this would be right here of depth exceeding numbers and we're not chopping down the numbers list because we need the whole list every iteration we don't we don't want to work on a chop list we might have to move something from the first position to the last or vice versa so we need to deal with that numbers as a whole then we go down here same condition as in the iterative case and if that allows us in then we come in here and swap the numbers and then after that we um, continue that little in place swapping numbers as long as we can get away with and as soon as we get an invalid number then we return from that case and we you know unwind all the way out of it and that will um should unwind us back out to to somewhere out here effectively and then this is kind of like the same this should in theory work with return right there as well and it does so we're just returning a bunch of nuns none 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 because these return itself and you can tell there's we don't ever return you know if we come up to our terminal cases here they return none so that's why that um, this one does return a an individual count value on the terminating cases but it doesn't return anything in the meantime which it doesn't really need to so if we want to make this a little bit more functionally correct what we can do is we pass numbers around instead of depending on that side effect to happen which can be bad the trade-off is well you can pass numbers around and then you know like in theory right like this there still could be side effects because this is a list in Python um, if we want to explicitly make sure we'd have to go like that and that effectively does a copy of numbers because it splices it and you know does a full splice and then that creates a copy passes it to itself but in that condition um, we could argue that it's not constant memory because it's sending splices of itself full splices of itself all over the place it looks crufty it's just not Pythonic so to speak it's not idiomatic of the language so the reason I'm even doing this little virtue signaling of sending the the value back to numbers is just to illustrate in a more functional language where you're not going to have those side effects without a bunch of extra work. This is how you'd want to do it. So you you take in this value numbers, assuming that numbers is more like, you know, I don't know if you want to think of it a constant or what, but you're, you know, it's just something that maybe if you edit, you get a copy back of, like maybe if it was a tuple, n tuple, whatever you want to think, n tuple. So you come in here, each one of these, those are cool. This returns a singular value, we know that, but in this function here, we need to just return numbers. Totally redundant in Python, but we're just doing it. And in that case, these returns right here will be much more meaningful, especially this one, because it will actually kick back out that number. This return will actually load that one in the final scenario. All right, let's go ahead and run that, make sure it works. Bam, it works. So that is that. That is how to, with an array of integers, whole numbers, to find the first missing positive integer in the linear time, which is 3n in this situation, right? And we can double check that here, same exact way. Um, what we'll do is we'll do global count, oops, global count, and then, um, We'll do count plus equals one. And in Python, you can use semicolons to do two statements on one line. So that's an option. We'll control C that. We're gonna add to this global count here. And um, that one should work just like that, I believe. 
and then right here we'll initialize that global count by just saying global count equals zero let's run it oh actually 12 for the last one so what we can do is on this final return here we'll uh we'll get a result back result equals and then we'll print count and then we'll return the result okay so there we can see so the worst 131 the third one right there so 11 times 3 would be 33 right so that's where you end up with that uh, 31 divided by 11 2.81 which isn't that bad at all it's just uh, we can actually do length of numbers length of numbers comma count and we can just see them all like that so yeah four times little over 2x little over 2x little over 3x what am I doing something wrong there that's that would be a first okay so the length 10 and the values 11 so counts coming in at 0 global and then we come okay first we're gonna come through swap numbers and we're gonna set the count plus equals 1 and that will even if it returns numbers that's plus 1 it's gonna try and come through here huh it's the first time I've ever seen it go over 3x and it's just by one it could be either be an off by one error usually it's slightly am I doing the math wrong on that 1031 length of 10 passes of 31 well that's interesting I, I don't think that violates the uh, the linear rule because even if it was five it would be fine but as long as that number's not growing so here's how we can verify so that's the third one right one two three 1031 right here of course we have 1 through 1031 the, our expected worst case so what we'll do is we'll copy that one down here and this is cool because I was wanting to do this anyway so with recursive we can get away with up to about 500 and what we'll do is we'll put that big number first oh we do have the 500 oh I didn't do it exactly the same okay so 500 and then what we can do is we can add another append another list onto it and n for in in uh, range 500 so what this will do is this will give us 0 up to but not including 500 for to go down here and say range 500 0 up to but not including 500 so uh, if we did the same thing but assign it to an R and then we say R uh, it's going to only have what 499 values right so 499 and then if we say r 500 it should be out of range out of range and then r 0 is 0 and r 10 is 9 or 10 yeah that's right uh, okay um and then we tack on that 500 since obviously that 500 wasn't in there and we tack it on to the very beginning and that gives us the same effect of the largest number first and then it causes us to have to swap through every single one of these so according to that theory this should be 3 times 500 would be 1501 maybe let's see 1503 okay so it's the number it's the resulting number basically times 3 instead of the resulting length times 3 but yeah that's uh that's that but if we go back to that oh we don't we can't go back to the iterative solution I erased it what a trip I don't maybe I didn't time the um, the recursive one or I could very easily be off by one or I could have been off by one in my old stuff there so this one's gonna come in here these are all terminating cases return one return one retrieve missing it's testing that first one then it's going to go in 
Yeah, so that count looks pretty good. We're definitely initializing it to zero right there. And then if we come in here, we're adding one to that count. And then we're testing for that. That would be the one case, and that would be right. Count would be one. And then this is just a terminating case. And then we come in here. So I guess the terminating case is what's costing those extra few little iterations, which isn't a huge deal, but they're real. You know, I, I think those should be counted because all this makes sense. So what it's doing is on the other one, you figure it's not looping through, like on the terminating count, like if you think about it, how I was counting in here for the while loop, um, on this situation, what it's gonna do is it's still gonna call itself one more time, so it is gonna come in here and increment like that. And then it will go through. I was trying to think if there's a way I can't really off the top of my head. I don't think there's a cleaner way to do it. And I think that's representative because it has to call itself one more time. And arguably, even in that iterative case, I almost want to say that maybe, you know, it is running this condition a few extra times, but it's not running this a few extra times. So whatever, it's a few constant, you know, it's, it's not like a, it, the number's not growing exponentially. It's not even growing really linearly, I wouldn't say. Or at worst, it's growing linearly, right? So it it's not a big deal. <laughs> um, it's just something to trip out on. That It's just a few, uh, give or take, you know, a few off by ones here or there for either one of these um, iterative cases. I don't think it's necessarily off by one, though. So with that, I'll shut up, and thanks for watching, and that's how to do the iterative linear time, constant space, lowest positive integer that does not exist in an array, daily coding problem number four, involved, I'll say, not hard, involved. Thanks again.